In the traditionally Christian nation of Denmark, the number of Muslim immigrants is growing. In fact, about 4% of the population is now Muslim. But there's also a vibrant ministry that's sharing the love of Christ to these immigrants. And it's led by a former Muslim. Dale Hurd has that story from Denmark. He's the pastor of a dynamic ministry to Denmark's Muslim immigrant community and is the author of The Forbidden Salvation, My Path to Freedom. His name is Masood Forazanda. Born a Muslim in Iran, he fled to Denmark in the 1980s. But his path to freedom took its greatest turn when his mother, who became a Christian, gave him a Bible. As a Muslim, this angered him and he decided to disprove it. But something different happened. When I began to study the Bible, I could see <clears throat> the picture of God, Allah, uh, and the picture of the God in Bible, it was very different. The God of Bible for me was the God of grace. And the grace and law is the differences, is the grace is love even though God loves you not because of you are something, uh, you do something special for him because of he loves you, he's your father. I, I, could, I could feel that my heart doesn't, didn't belong to Islam anymore. Masood was running his own business in Denmark when he says Jesus appeared to him in a dream and called Masood to serve him. He began Mohabet, the church of love, shown in this video. And uh, our mission was to go out and tell everyone we know and most of them we knew that in that time were Muslims. And their success has made some Muslims in Denmark very angry. The Danish media has reported about how Pastor Masood has been threatened by Muslims, had one car damaged and another destroyed. But he says this opposition and persecution is only causing the church in Denmark to grow. In Europe, in many, many hundred years, the church has not been challenged. And you can see what is happening now with our churches. But now, Hallelujah. in these 20 years I have been in Denmark, church is growing, church is waking up, people are waking up. Today, the Church of Love has congregations in three different cities, and the threat of violence is not stopping the gospel from reaching more and more Danish Muslims. No matter what happened, the good news is we believe in God mm -hmm. and we build in love and on love. Dale heard CBN News in Odense, Denmark. Um, I love this brother of mine that I'm going to bring in that I haven't talked to in a while, but it's his first time on Worldview Matters. He's a pastor, a teacher of pastors, an evangelist, and we're going to get a lot of information on his background, how you can share the gospel with Muslims, and basically the differences between American Christianity and biblical Christianity. I know that could be a six-hour show, <laughs> but I want to bring in my friend Elijah Abraham. Welcome to Worldview Matters, brother. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure to be in your show, uh, previous show, but uh, I'm really happy for you with uh, what you are doing now, and I know God is going to use it uh, for His glory. Yeah, so far so good, and, and I want to believe that He is uh, using it, and I'm so thankful, and that's because of the guests that I've been able to talk to, uh, like yourself. It's good to get you over here now, and uh, I, we will continue this conversation Lord willing, if Jesus doesn't return in the near future, many, many times. But I want to, first of all, our audience cannot see you. They can hear you, but they cannot see you. I want you to explain your background. You grew up in Iraq, and secure, right. for security reasons, uh, you are not uh, sharing audio or video and pictures. When you go to the events, you tell people don't take pictures. And so I want you to explain your, your history and why that is. Right. Um, uh, like you said, I grew up in uh, Iraq uh, as a Muslim, and uh, the Lord brought me to America, and, and I could tell you a little bit about my testimony in a little bit. But the reason for not showing my pictures, because I am a missionary, global missionary. I've been in 47 countries, uh, and sometimes the Lord leads me to uh, go to Muslim countries or Hindu countries or um, communist countries that uh, they are not very friendly to the gospel. They're not friendly to uh, missionaries or pastors or teachers like myself. 
So, and also here in America, uh, we had a number of death threats uh, on my life and my family. I had to evacuate my family twice in different locations. So um, the Lord, when he called us, he did not call us to be stupid. Uh, for, so God wants us to be wise, uh, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So uh, this is one of my way of trying to be wise, uh, not to uh, accelerate anything that uh, it's not in God's timing. So uh, that's why the reason I, I ask that when I travel overseas or even here in American churches, I do speak at, I do request, please do not take my photos, do not audio tape or videotape, uh, because uh, once somebody take my, uh, my photo, I don't know that person, it's out of anybody's control, because once it's uh, pulled up and or uploaded in uh, social media, uh, it's a done deal. Then uh, it makes our ministry more difficult as well as um, threatening a uh, threat to my family. Boy, when you say you've had death threats, uh, that's uh, yeah. a modern understanding of uh, they hated Jesus and they will hate us as well. I mean, you're living it, brother. You do a lot of international traveling and and you go to Muslim countries. And um, I'm just so thankful for the work that you do. Um, can we go a little bit back before... Um, you came to Texas. I think you went to seminary there, if I remember right. right. Just share a little bit about your history and when you came to the Lord and uh, whatever you'd like to share. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you the short version of my testimony. I mean, if we yeah. sit down, we could talk for two or three hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, uh, like I said, grew up in a Muslim family. When you're a, uh, grow, uh, born in a Muslim family, you have no choice but to be a Muslim. Um, and... Uh, Due to the war in Iran and Iraq, my dad had to smuggle me out of the country uh, at the risk of his life and the risk of the family life. Cost him almost $100,000 back then, which is equivalent to $400,000 of today's money. Um, I lived in Europe for about uh, seven years. And while I'm in Europe, uh, it was the end of my tenure there. Um, also received death threats, uh, got beaten up a number of times, not for faith, but Saddam wanted more men to come and uh, fight the, his war with Iran in the 80s. So I had to escape and come to the United States. Mm. Not until 1995, when I met my wife and the Lord used her really to, for me to question my faith because of her life. And that's when I got in the word of God and uh, asked the Lord to show me if I'm saved, uh, assure me, but if I'm lost, convict me. Well, guess what? He convicted me. Hmm. Uh, it took me a few months uh, later for a lot of study and contemplating and a lot of fear, of course, and Satan used that against me. But ultimately, uh, through a, a, another event that uh, I surrendered my life to the Lord and uh, it was an amazing transformation because I never thought uh, God loved me. There is no such thing in Islam that Allah loves humanity or humans, especially Muslims. Um, because the relationship between Allah and Muslim is a slave to slave master and relationship in Christ, uh, father to a son, adopted son in Christ Jesus. Hmm. So that, that was uh, it's a really big, huge. It took me a long time to finally dare to call God father. Huh. Uh, it, it just was uh, unheard of for a Muslim yeah. to call God father. Uh, but it's such an intimate, uh, wonderful, sweet uh, fellowship that uh, we as Christians should not take that for granted. We just need to thank the Lord for his sacrifice to give us Amen. that opportunity and the privilege to be his children. Growing up Muslim, I believed in Islam. I believed in it to my utmost. I was taught to pray five times a day. I did. I was taught to fast during Ramadan. I did. I had large sections of the Quran memorized. Five chapters memorized by the age of five. Uh, over 15 chapters memorized by my teen years. I mean, I was a very devout Muslim. <laughs> My parents had taught me that the reason why I should be Muslim is because it's true. It makes plain sense. If it's false, why believe it? And so whenever I dialogued with Christians, my basic understanding was, and their basic understanding was, we should believe the truth. The question is, how do we know what's true? And as a Muslim, I had reasons for believing in Islam. And as I began to challenge Christians and started finding answers to questions that I had, I, I wanted to come up with a systematized way of determining whether or not Christianity is plausible. Now it turns out Christianity does allow for itself to be falsifiable. There are many religions out there, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, where you can believe in their philosophical tenets and there's no real way of ever knowing whether or not it's true. You can't test it. 
the best you can do is live it for a while. Christianity is not like that. Christianity very clearly offers a test of falsifiability, and that is the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. Paul teaches us this kind of thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. And we have a method for knowing whether or not Christianity is true. On the flip side, the early disciples, that's what they were preaching was the resurrection. They weren't preaching to people, hey, do you want a better life? Because they knew becoming a Christian meant dying, quite likely. They weren't preaching, hey, do you want to go to heaven? And that was something that came along with the Christian message was you knowing the way to eternal life. But that wasn't the central focus. The focus was believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. And if you do believe that and you're baptized for the forgiveness of sins, then you'll be saved. So number one, did the resurrection happen or not? Number two, did Jesus claim to be God or not? If Jesus did not claim to be God, that kind of changes the entire Christian uh, message. And number three, did he die on the cross for our sins or not? If Jesus didn't die on the cross for our sins, then all of Christianity is built on a false premise. Now these three things are all historical in nature. Either the man claimed to be God in history or he did not. Either he died on the cross in history or he did not. Either he rose from the dead in history or not. So these aren't just things we would believe. They are subject to uh, investigability, historically speaking, using the historical method. With Islam, there's kind of a similar thing. There's investigability. Who is this man Muhammad? Did he exist? Is he a prophet of God or not? And that's the central claim of Islam. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Uh, there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So for me, there was investigability on both sides. The question was, when I look into history, using a historian's glasses, looking through his eyes, what do I find? And so I started looking through the historical method to see the evidence. And after a grueling four years of studying these matters, I concluded that the evidence for Jesus' death on the cross is incontrovertible. You can either believe nothing about history regarding Jesus' death, or you can believe he died on the cross. There's really nothing, no other way around it. When it comes to the other two, did Jesus rise from the dead? That is by far the best historical conclusion. A lot of people will say that's not a historical conclusion, that's a supernatural conclusion. I think you've got the cart before the horse. The question is, does, should we just presuppose naturalism? And there's no reason to. Take all the uh, answers, all the possible solutions to the historical event into account. And the resurrection is by far the one that answers the historical issues surrounding his death the best. So, number one, did he die on the cross? Incontrovertible. Number two, did he rise from the dead? The best conclusion, historically speaking, is that he did. And number three, did he claim to be God? Again, historically speaking, by far, the answer that provides the most insights to the evidence is that Jesus did claim to be God. So the case is very strong. کہ نہیں ہرگز ایسا نہیں ہے تو میں نے کہا پھر مجھے یہ تو بتائیں القرآن لفظ کے میننگز کیا ہے تو وہ جب یہ بات ہوئی تو تھوڑی دیر خموش ہوئے سر نیچے کیا تو بعد میں کہتے ہیں کہ یہ اس کا مطلب ہے ہدایت والی کتاب میں نے کہا نہیں استاذی آپ کو پتا ہے کہ میں بھی ایک قرآن کا حافظ ہوں اور میں ایک علماء کے گرانے سے تعلق رکھتا ہوں اور میں اتنا بھی نہیں ہوں کہ جو مجھے اس چیز کا پتا نہ ہو میں نے کہا کہ بعض یہ ہے القرآن لفظ جو ہے وہ سگا جمع میں آ جاتا ہے اور القرآن لفظ جو ہے اقرا سے نکلا ہے اور اقرا سگا واحد ہے اور جس کا مطلب ہے پڑھنا اقرا پڑھنا اور القرآن لفظ جو ہے وہ سگا جمع بن جاتا ہے اور جب سگا جمع کے بارے میں ترجمہ کیا جائے تو وہاں پر لکھا ہوا بار بار پڑھے جانے والی کتاب اور جب ہم اس بات کو دیکھتے ہیں تو میں نے کہا کہ ساجی اس کا مطلب ہے بار بار پڑھے جانے والی کتاب تو وہ ہنسکار کہتے ہیں اچھا ٹھیک ہے اور جاتے ہوئے میرے دادا جی کو کہتے ہیں کہ چودھری صاحب جو پڑھا ہے اس کو ہم پڑھا نہیں سکتے کہتے کیا مطلب کہتے کہ اپنے پوتے سے پوچھ لیں جب وہ چلے گئے تو دادا جی میرے پاس ہے وہ مجھے کہتے ہیں رانا کیا بات ہے اس کو بگا دیا میں نے دادا جی میں نے تو کچھ نہیں کہا میں تو صرف ان سے پوچھا تھا کہ قرآن لفظ کا مطلب کیا ہے اور انہوں نے مجھے اس چیز کا نہیں بتایا کہ میں کیا کروں اور میں نے ان کو بتایا کہ القرآن لفظ کا مطلب بار بار پڑھنا تو وہ پھر ہنسنا شروع ہو گئے وہ کہتے ہیں کہ لگتا ہے یہ تمام علماء جو ہے نا یہ تمہارے سوالوں کا جواب نہیں دے پائیں گے تو میں نے کہا دادا پھر یہ بات یاد رکھیں کہ مجھے اس قرآن کو جاننا ہے مجھے دین اسلام کو جاننا ہے اور جب تک میں نہیں جانوں گا مجھے سکون نہیں آئے گا اور یہی بات ہوئی 
कि जब ऐसी बात हुई तो मैंने नमाज तरावी पढ़ाने की बजाय मैंने इतकाफ बैठना मंजूर किया इसलिए कि मैं कुरान को तर्जमे के साथ पढ़ूंगा और मुझे पता चलेगा कि कुरान में ऐसी कौन सी बात है जो इंसान को गुमराह कर देती है और अजीजो मैंने इसी वजह से कुरान को फिर तर्जमे के साथ पढ़ना शुरू किया ताकि मुझे पता चले कि इसमें कौन सी ऐसी बात है जो हमें जो है मुर्तद कर देती है जो हमें इस्लाम से खारिज कर देती है जो हमें गुमराह कर देती है इस्लाम के लिहाज से तो गुमराह कह जाते हैं लेकिन मैं आपको यह बताना चाहता हूं जब मैं कुरान को तरतीब के साथ पढ़ना शुरू हुआ तो मुझे पता चला कि वहां पर सुरह बकरा में वाज तौर पर लिखा हुआ है कि सुम बुकम उमजुम फाहम ला जर्च उम कि वो गूंगे हैं बहरे हैं बोले हैं जो सुनते नहीं जो देखते हैं और देखते नहीं है और ये ऐसा कि मैं देखकर हैरान हो गया कि ये किन लोगों के बाबत कहा गया है और यकीन जब मैंने थोड़ा सा आगे पढ़ा और फिर जब सुरह आल इमरान और उसकी 55 फाइव को मैं स्टडी कर रहा था वाजे तौर पर वहां लिखा हुआ है फतेहुल्ला फाबद हाजत सिरात मुस्ताकिन के तुम खुदा से डरो और मेरा हुक्म मानो और यही सीधा रास्ता है ये कौन फरमा रहे हजरत ईसा अल मसीह फरमाते हैं कि तुम खुदा से डरो और मेरा हुक्म मानो हाजर सरात मुस्तकीम यही सीधा रास्ता है जब मैंने इस बात को पढ़ा तो मैं परेशान हो गया कि ये कौन सी ऐसी बात है अल्लाह मुझे तो समझ नहीं आ रही है हमें तो आज तक यही बताया गया है कि अल्लाह और अल्लाह के रसूल का सीधा रास्ता है लेकिन कुरान बता रहा है कि जो सीधा रास्ता है वो सिर्फ और सिर्फ सैदना यशवर मसीह का है और यही बात हुई कि जब मैंने थोड़ा सा आगे पढ़ा तो उस फिफ्टी फाइव वर्ष में लिखा हुआ है नाव का फाउक अल्लाह से नाफारू इला योम की यामा ऐसा मसीह तेरे मानने वालों को गलबा ता करूंगा काफरों पर ता क्या मत और जब मैंने इस वर्ष को पढ़ा तो मेरी जिंदगी यकीन जाना अजीजों मेरी जिंदगी में एक हलचल सी मच गई मेरी जिंदगी में एक बुनचाल आ गया एक तूफान बरपा हुआ कि हाय ए हाफिज ए नदीम तेरी जिंदगी कहां गुजरी है कुरान तो कहता है कि जो यशु मसीह को नहीं मानता जो ईसा मसीह को नहीं मानता वो काफर है तो मेरी जिंदगी में इस कदर बेचैनी आ गई कि मैं आपको बता नहीं सकता हूं मेरे पास वैसे अल्फाज नहीं है कि मैं किन अल्फाजों के साथ अजीज आपको बताऊं कि जब मैंने इस कुरान की तीसरा सुपारा सूरत आल इमरान उसके फिफ्टी फाइव वर्ष को पढ़ा तो मेरी जिंदगी में अजीब सी बेचैनी आ गई कि हाय नदीम तेरी जिंदगी कहां गुजरी तूने अपनी जिंदगी को क्यों जया कर दिया कि तू ने ऐसी जिंदगी बस कर दी जो कि एक ऐसी पर्सनैलिटी की कि मुनकर होकर तुम उजहा जिसकी तुम मुखालफत करता रहा जिसके मारने वालों को तुम मारता रहा जिसके मारने वालों को तुम उससे छीनता रहा और उन लोगों को इस दार इस्लाम में दाखिल करता रहा और जब मैंने इस बात को देखा तो मेरी जिंदगी में एक अजीब हल चलाई मैं परेशान होना रहना शुरू हो गया कि हाय अब मैं कैसे जिंदगी बसर करूंगा मेरे से जो गुना हुए वो कैसे माफी होंगी और फिर बार बार जियात मेरी जिंदगी में आ रही थी नत्ता बाहू का फौक अल्लाह से ना काफर इलाज अमल की यामा नत्ता बाहू का फौक अल्लाह से ना काफर इलाज अमल की यामा ऐसा मैं सिर्फ तेरे मारने वालों को गलबा ता करूंगा काफरों पर ता क्या मत अजीजों ये वो ऐप थी जिसने मेरी जिंदगी को हला दिया और इस ये साबित करती है कि के मानने वाले फाते लोग हैं गालिब लोग हैं उसके अलावा और कोई भी ऐसा मजहब नहीं है कोई भी ऐसा दिन नहीं है जो कि गालिब जाके फता आने वाला फता पाने वाला हो फता पाने वाला सिर्फ एक और एक ही है कि अगर हम उसकी पैरवी करेंगे तो हम फाते लोग बनेंगे क्योंकि वो खुद भी फाते हैं और इसलिए कि जब मैंने इस बात को उसकी फतेह याबी के नारे को नरसिंह को सुना तो मैंने इस बात से अपने आप को रोक ना सका कि अब मैं उसकी पैरवी करने से नहीं रुक पाऊंगा और यकीनन जब ये मेरी जिंदगी में बात आई तो मैंने अपनी जिंदगी उस जात अकदस के सामने जिसका नाम यशवर मसीह है उनके सामने मैंने अपनी जिंदगी को सिलेंडर कर दिया और मैंने अपने ग्राहों की तोबा की और मैंने कहा कि अब मेरे से ये गुवारा नहीं है कि मैं आपसे जुदा कर सकूं कि मैं काफर बन के रह सकूं बल्कि मैं चाहता हूं कि मेरी जिंदगी की मुआफी हो और मैं अपनी जिंदगी खुदाम यसुमसी आपके सामने सिलेंडर करता हूं His life has been full of trauma and yet I see this powerful passion in him for saving as many souls as he can. It is only because now he knows how wrong he had been and it is unbearable now to see billions of souls 
going down the road to hell. This is the love we should have for Christ. If we love him, we should love our neighbors. We should love the people who don't know the Christ yet, we, who don't know what salvation is, who have no idea how much he holds for them. A person cried several times to Allah, I want to kill Christians. I want to kill Jews. I want to glorify your name. You know, with my friends in the government in Iran, we planned a lot of things, evil things for Christian world, cruel things for Jewish world, deceiving um, plans for black world. But by the grace of God, I am here speaking for the glory of his name. Once once trying to destroy the church, but now I'm trying to establish the church of God, strengthen it, and cherish my love toward all other nations, including Muslims and Jews. And the message coming from these believers is the 2,000-year-old message of the gospel. I want to tell the world, accept the love of God. It will be today or in the future. They have to kneel to God. It's better to do it right now. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Iraqi Kurdistan. I born as a Muslim. My real name was Muhammad Kamil. I never know any good news you guys had. What I know about Christianity just from your TV and my favorite actor in American uh, TV, it's uh, East Clintwood. Or Clint Wood, uh, yeah, East Clint Wood, right? That's how you call him. That was my favorite actor. And all I see in your TV, guns, killing, liquor, woman in bikini. That's it. And that's what in the Muslim mind, all around the globe, if you ask any Muslim, what do you think about Christianity? Christianity? is Hollywood for Muslims around the world. And I never thought to be a Christian. And why I would become a Christian, to be like this guy, and I have a friend for 12 years, a Christian. 12 years. I wanted you to remember this. Because every time I, I remember this, I, 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 it bothered me. 12 years, he never told me, Jesus loves you. He never gave me a Bible. He never invited me to his church. 12 years, a Christian friend. Let me ask you, my friend. <clears throat> when was the last time you give someone a Bible? That's between you and God now. When was the last time you told someone, Jesus loves you? I wanted to pray with you right now. When was the last time? Are you like my friend, 12 years? I sleep in his home. He come to my house. We're spending most of our time together. He never told me, Jesus loves you. And one day, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and one day I decided to make fun of him. I said, let me mock him and mock his Christianity. You see, that's what happened. If you are silent, the enemy will attack you. But if you are on the march, the enemy will bow down. And all the power of Satan will be broken in your life, in the family's life, your friend's life. Christianity always working, moving. There is no turning back. And I go to the high rising building. I will go inside the elevator. And the minute the elevator closes, guess what? I have a captive audience. I will start telling them about Jesus until the door is open and everybody running. I stopped praying, Lord, give me ideas. 
And I made my commitment to share the gospel with 10 people a day. 10 people. I will not sleep. That's my commitment. Lord, I will share the gospel with 10 people every day. And I will count them at the end of the day. If I found there are eight, I'm missing two. Guess what I will do? I will go to the street. I will stop taxi. And I will take a taxi a couple of blocks. And guess who is number nine? The taxi driver. <laughs> and this is number nine. I told him, after I share the gospel, please drop me here. And then I will take another taxi back home. That's number 10. How many people you share the gospel with every day? Are you working with the Lord? What's going on with churches in America? At least make a commitment to share the gospel with one person. 